Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, guys. This is an amazing crowd. It's really great to be here. How to stop migration. One. Glad for the dust I am, for in its pattern I see an order beyond its name. Civility in the rain as well. Window I wish to break. Window I broke all the same, repaired, broke again. The bees get used to their keeper, one of their own. And the sky, once wrapped in a rug, did not turn out to be the same sky when unwrapped and revealed. But how could I have known? Tell me. How could I have known my body would fit so well into a barrel, into the river, over the falls? How to stop migration? 5,000 doves died black, a darkened sky, a voice says Houdini would have worn three pairs of handcuffs, a lead blindfold, and it's true, shaking them all off. Two, what's more important than all of this? What's always been more important than any of this is the question of how to set work aside for another day. For instance, every 90 seconds a grocery cart is stolen in America, but where, the voice asks, do they all go? The frontier is a grand place, but a mountain of steel and twisted metal is grander somehow in the eaves of the mind, if only for the strange beauty of it. But wait. I do not mean to say a pile of shopping carts can somehow overtake what nature has always had a right to. After all, I was once called a nature poet by my mother, and nature weighs more than all the shopping carts in the world. <laughs> really, all of this is as peripheral to us as only mass can be. Truly, all of this is to say, step away from the tree you've been leaning against. Come with me, can you? Come with me to the top of these shopping carts and look at the moon and tell me, please tell me, is it not right now more beautiful than it's ever been? I used to always read that poem at the end of the reading, so when I read it the first poem, I always want to like walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for people to clap. <laughs> is that enough? Do you guys think that? <laughs> Um, it's really great to be, to be here, like I said, and thank you, Ryan, so much. This is wonderful, wonderful to be here. And uh, I was with Alex, we read in Galesburg, Illinois, last night, and it's been a good, even two days on the road, it's, it's been good. Um, I wish we could do this some more. You want to hang out some more? Anytime. Let's do it. Um, my, my book is about Michigan. I, I, I moved to Illinois recently, but I lived in Michigan for a while, so this book was written while I was living in Kalamazoo. Um, so a lot of the poems are about living in Michigan in the Midwest. Uh, this poem I wrote on the train going from Kalamazoo to Chicago, and it's supposed to be a love poem. Um, my wife doesn't think it's a love poem. There's like fire breathing and dead, dead bugs and Civil War references. And, I don't know, so this is what happens when I try to write a love poem. For your eyelash anchored to the sky, I am riding backward through Michigan toward Chicago. I am thinking of a specific place and time a smashed caterpillar somehow on a windshield, somehow other how. I am always wishing you were here. I am thinking of a general place and time. I was watching a boot fill up with blood, and I said nothing. A school of geese, each one turns to a door when I touch your hand. What can you say to the inside of a piano? Can you play it with your teeth? I'm tying a typewriter to my leg with a heavy piece of thread because I do not want to be dragged to the bottom, because I want to watch thousands of words spill out and up toward me. I want to watch you laughing down from the pier. I want to breathe fire only to see my reflection in your iris, your left iris, the one sculpted from a thousand tiny feathers. I was reading that poem one time, and my five-year-old daughter was in the crowd. She was three at the time, and I read those lines. I, uh, what can we say to the inside of a piano? Can you play it with your teeth? And my daughter was like, no. <laughs> so, I did heckle a lot of reading somehow. And my daughter is, is learning how to do that. Which is great, right? I was at a reading one time in, this, in Austin outside, and this was in the middle of a poem, and like 
this car pulls up. This is in a parking lot. This is like Art Gallery. This car pulls up, and this guy gets out wearing like a white suit, a white hat, comes right up to the front of the crowd and stands right there and watches me. This is in the middle of a poem, right? What is happening? Everyone, you know, I look in the back and everyone has their phones out there recording. Like, this is going to be good. Whatever. This is going to be really good. And he's just like up there, like, and he's never in a poetry reading crowd. And he just doesn't know what to do. He's like up there, just like, yeah. And I finished the poem. He's like, that was good. He has wallet out to like leave a tip, and he realized there wasn't a tip jar. And he just got back in the car and left. It's amazing. I read that poem really fast. Really fast. Um, this poem is called Self Portrait with House Slippers and Tap Water. And um, it's a poem that owes a lot to a poem by Jay Hopler, which is called Self Portrait with Whiskey and Pistol. And, uh, um, I, I give my students assignments all the time, but I also do the assignments because I feel like that's only fair you know, to do them as well. So um, it's a poem in eight parts. They're really short parts. I just have to say that. I say, like, there's a poem in eight parts, and people just, the air leaves the room. Like, oh, eight parts. They're short. Self portrait with house slippers and tap water. One. In bed, a rose thorn in my finger. A celebration of the day was all I turned out to be. Two. Maybe disappearing is what I meant. A lover's hair clogging the drain. Maybe disappearing is what I meant. Three, the beginning of a beautiful season. Four, even if what they say is true, pain exists to magnify love. You wouldn't change your hum to accommodate loneliness. Five, oh dog, oh dog, can I understand hunger for a moment through your mind? What would heaven be if you couldn't manage abstractions? Six, or if you could. Seven, headlights for a reading lamp, the beginning of a beautiful season. Eight, I am washing the sand. I am washing each grain of sand. When you, when you live in Michigan, you write about the weather a lot. Um, it sort of just ends up in your poems. And, uh, this poem is uh, called Thought for a Stall World. Um, we had a, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the weather throughout the poem, but we had a, a house, in, um, an old, older house with you know, hardwood floors, but the middle of the, the hardwood floors was this like unfinished pine, so you would be, you know, like you put a rug down, but you'd always be walking through the room, and maybe you'd step on the unfinished pine and get the splinters. One time, I got a splinter in my fingernail, um, straight down to the cuticle. And so the poem kind of came from, from that experience. I'm sorry for that. If there's a chalkboard, I would, I would scratch it. But, um, I should say there's a couple lines from a Dickinson, Emily Dickinson poem in this, in this uh, poem. You'll hear them because they're like the best lines in the poem. And then the poem continues, which is really stupid. <laughs> but, uh, thank you, Emily. So, anyways. Thought for Stall World. In early June, a late frost, an airplane coming apart above us and then catching hold in the mind, the dogs down the street lunging at each other, and the grass in your hair from yesterday still there. We have danced over, lived with, barely missed, countless splinters, except for the one that went right under my fingernail, straight to the cuticle, a reminder that pain has a beauty all its own. The nail divided down the middle, a line drawn, an elegy hidden in each fingertip, an elegy slipping out in the middle of the night like it owns a place. Because it does. Because it does, we put a price on beauty, on pain, on elegy, and think nothing of it. I do not wish to be didactic. I do not wish to preach to the boy pulling his wagon down the cracked sidewalk, the wagon missing a wheel, for he already knows as well as I do that time is a pitchfork stuck sideways in a barn wall, a note pinned underneath reading, when winds take forests in their paws, the universe is still, and even if it wasn't, we wouldn't even know it. If moving feels this way, think of what being still will do. Imagine thinking of beauty with no momentum behind it. When winds take forests in their paws, the universe is still. It's a terrifying Dickinson poem. I love it, it's my favorite, but it's 
I saw her, I went to her house a few years ago. Have anyone been to Dickinson's house before? It's amazing. It's like, you imagine it being this like dark sort of like cavernous place, but it's like, she got full sunlight like all day long in her room where she wrote. It's just lit up. It's beautiful. And she had a dog named Carlo. You guys know that? She had a dog named Carlo that she hung out with. Yeah. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read the three, three more poems, I think. Um, this next poem, um, I wrote a series of poems for this book that were um, ekphrastic poems, uh, poems based on paintings. Um, I wrote probably like a dozen of these poems, and they just all were really terrible. Like, they just didn't click. Nothing happened with them. Um, and I had this, like, revelation one day. I woke up in the morning, and I thought, like, I can write, like, I can write, like, Ekphrastic poems, but they can be about like fake works of art, like works that don't exist. Like, fake frastic, I think is what so I was like, you should call it fake frastic. Um, so this is, this is a fake frastic poem. So it's a poem about a painting that, that doesn't exist. Um, so if you go looking for this painting, it's not, it's not there. Um, I'm gonna do an anthology of fake frastic poems. So if you all wanna write some fake frastic poems, send it to me. It's called Goodbye to All That, The Birds Included. There's some other things in the painting I didn't see the first time around. The hull of a car, the trash scattered in the air, and scholars thought they were birds. I kind of did too. After all this time, goodbye to all that and this and that. I hope the insects become magnetic to eat plastic hillsides, to pull a drone down even. It might even be a collage now that I'm looking closer. What does any of this even mean? What is there in the world we do not wish to say goodbye to? Goodbye to war? A scholar once said that war makes us rhyme with each other. And music is a fluttering trash in a collage or painting or whatever we want to call it. It's under glass, so I place my face up against the reflection and wait for it to pull me inside. So I'll read a couple of new poems to close. Um, that'll be, I think they'll be in the, in the new book uh, called Stranger, which is out in a couple of years. Um, this is a poem called uh, Nightcap for Stillwater. Anyone ever been to Stillwater, Oklahoma? It's, a, it's sort of a terrifying place. I'm glad to leave Stillwater, Oklahoma. I mean, I loved it. It was a great, I mean, everyone was great there, but it's one of those places where you sort of, you imagine you could just sort of buy a carton of cigarettes and Stay forever. <laughs> I did. Know. I did. Um, I, I was on. I was on tour, like a poetry tour, for a week with, with my dear friends Michael and Ada, and um, we tour in April typically. So when we read poems, we do this sort of like round robin thing where um, the first person reads a poem, and the next person reads a poem that kind of rips off that poem somehow. So there's no set. You know, you don't know what you're going to read when you get out there, basically. Um, and but because it's April and it's National Poetry Month, what, the person who goes first that night has to write a poem written that day. Right? So you're in the car driving somewhere writing a poem. So I wrote this Leaving Stillwater, Oklahoma, uh, after reading a poem by Bob Hickok, which um, sort of made me think, like, why do we write poems? You, know, you, read this, you read these poems and you're like, why do I bother? Like, why don't I just like, read Bob Hickok poems? Um, so this one came from, came from that. It's called Nightcap for Stillwater. We left the bar from Stillwater and we went back and to have a nightcap, I think, with the, the people that were hosting us. And we we're getting ready to leave the second time, and they're like, did you guys find your hat? They're like, what do you mean, our hat? They're like, your nightcap, did you find it? <laughs> we didn't find it. <laughs> nightcap for still water. Some mornings I read poems, and my first impulse is to remain silent, as though even the simple act of conversing would further complicate a world continually unfolding before us perhaps like an observer on the outside of a field, perhaps like an observer on the outside of a field, the field has somehow filled in the space around me. In moments like last night, one cannot help but wonder about the sharp edge of a year and the dullness of them adding up one by one. It's certain that I'm not the same person I was back then, and even now I have a temptation to swerve this life off into another one. If life is a flight where I lose everything and everything belongs to oblivion, then I can live with that. After all, what choice do we have? An observer on the outside of the field, 
I am a different person altogether. I am suddenly standing there with you, your hand touching my arm. So I'll close, um, I'll close with this poem. Yeah, read a different poem. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. Um, I, I teach in the summers at Canyon College for their Young Writers program, and it's a really intense experience because you're like with these high school students for like six hours a day, and you write with them. So you're writing poems the whole time. Um, so I wrote a lot, but this is the summer for last. Um, so we read a poem by James Wright, a sort of pastoral poem, and there's a poem by Rachel Zucker that was in the King Review. It was kind of like, you know, like, fuck pastoral poems, basically. It was an amazing poem. So we talked a lot about, like, poems that are sort of communicating with each other, and so my poem is sort of a response to Rachel Zucker's poem. Um, it's called This Pastoral Way of Living. There's a lie in this poem. I say dogs in this poem. I only have one dog, but it sounded better to have two dogs. So, it's like I have to be honest with you about what's about to happen. Um, thanks again for, for coming out. I'm really, really excited to be here. And um, yeah, like hang around and talk afterwards. Like, it'll, it'll be great. This, this pastoral way of living. To break a season open with your bare hands would mean disregarding our own perceptions by replacing them with the obsessions of others. In light, the world exists through our knowledge of the sky, tree limbs, and all types of weather, as if anything could fall, as if anything could be categorized so simply as either weightless or disruptive. I step over raised dirt most days, pretend that its existence can be its own type of becoming. Like animals mimicking other animals, the trees do not move unless the earth thinks to release them. Should we be envious of their immobility? Insects invent so many ways of moving, and most of us think nothing of it. Would it be sensible to pause daily in a sense of knowledge or fear? And what else? I don't entirely believe that one must see something to understand it. In Kentucky, there are horses everywhere, and there are hundreds of roads you can take to see them. I believe in the pastoral because I leave, live in the pastoral. The trees are so bucolic here that they call out at the end of the day. They bend under their weight of our unknowing. Some days I take the dogs out to run at land once owned by the Boone family. There I watch the blades of grass stir, and I pause to think about the complications language can bring into the world, a world we can lie down in, a world where sometimes even the horses disregard our presence. Like a double fence along the highway, the mind is an expanse, but there's always an end, a border. From one thought to another, I'm calling out to you. I'm calling out to you, as if we're building a nest, one word at a time. Thank you so much.